You're with the fine print. I'm Aisha Sindhu. Minorities are being religiously tortured in Pakistan. Sikhs in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa are worried. They're very worried. Forced conversions are the order of the day. There's no jizya or religious tax just yet. But Sikhs are told that they must convert to Islam if they don't feel safe. So the modus operandi is simple. First, threaten minorities and then offer protection under the umbrella of Islam. Let's take a step back. Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, had envisaged a secular country. A country where people were free to practice their religion. A country where the government didn't discriminate between temples and mosques. But ask the Sikhs of the Hangu district of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and a scary picture emerges, that of a state that dehumanizes minorities. Sikhs are being forced to convert to Islam in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. There's an administrative unit or tehsil in the province. Close to 60 Sikhs living in this administrative unit have requested protection. These Sikhs allege assistant commissioner of uh, the province, Yaqub Khan, told them to convert to Islam if they didn't feel safe. It's a clear case of government officials forcing minorities to convert to Islam. In fact, the Sikh leader, Farid Chan Singh, lodged a complaint against the assistant commissioner. The district administration first ignored the complaint, but later suspended the assistant commissioner when pressure was built. Now, to many, it will come across as an insignificant piece of news tumbling out of Pakistan. But no, it deserves all the attention and there are reasons behind it. Sikhs have been living in this region at least since 1901, much before Pakistan even came into existence. A century and two decades later, they are being forced to convert. In 1947, there were 23% non-Muslims in Pakistan. Now that figure stands at a dismal 3 to 4%. And before we hear from our guests from Pakistan, let's show you that Weon has consistently reported on the plight of minorities in Pakistan. Weon's Islamabad bureau chief, Taha Siddiqui, had earlier this year covered the story of Priya Rani from Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. She was also allegedly abducted and then forcibly converted. Something is seriously wrong with this province of Pakistan. So is India alarmed? Yes. Does India intend to act? Yes. In fact, a delegation of Akali Dal leaders today met the High Commissioner of Pakistan. India has lived up to its reputation of a secular and a democratic country. Meanwhile, Pakistan has failed to uphold either of those two values. India wants Pakistan to protect its minorities. Joining me this evening, Ahmer Shaheen. He's a senior journalist based out of Pakistan. Ahmer, good evening. Thanks very much for joining us here on the broadcast. Are minorities more and more at risk in Pakistan? All right, uh, we seem to be having a little bit of difficulty uh, hearing Emer. Let me try and get back to him in just a second. In the meantime, for our viewers who are just joining the broadcast, we're talking about the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in Pakistan, where Sikhs are being told a simple thing. You either convert or otherwise face persecution as a minority. Emer Shaheen, a senior journalist in Pakistan, joining us once again on the broadcast. Uh, Emer, I hope you can hear me this time. Uh, my question to you was, uh, are minorities yes, in Pakistan feeling more and more threatened? Are they more at risk in Pakistan than ever before? Uh, yes, Aisha, it needs to be categorically stated that uh, minorities in Pakistan have been under attack. Uh, forced, when you talk about forced conversions, uh, forced conversions is of two types. One type is when you literally force somebody to convert, otherwise there are dire consequences. Other kind of forced conversion is when the society and the economic reasons kind of force you to become, uh, you know, join the mainstream religion. Having said that categorically, I think it's, it's, it's rather, I, I mean, it's a sad story, but it's rather amusing how the Pakistani Foreign Office is concerned about the lack of rights 
the minorities in India, and the Indian uh, authorities are more concerned about the lack of minority rights in Pakistan, whereas I think they it would be better if they just you know concentrate on issues pertaining to their own countries. I wouldn't say that Indian channels or India should not talk about minority rights or the lack of it in Pakistan. But I mean, as long as the administration or the foreign office is concerned of both the countries, they are more concerned about raising concerns about the lack of rights of the other country rather than their own country. And I think this is where the problem lies as well. You mentioned two factors, I, I uh, Ahmed, allow me to come and you mentioned two yeah. factors that could lead to conversions taking place. Which one of them is more rampant in your opinion? Um, or, um, I would, uh, the media would give attention, obviously, to the more violent version of it, where people are, um, you know, like some, uh, the Hindu girls issue in third was one of those uh, big stories. They make the headlines. And it's condemnable, of course, and it needs to be uh, eradicated. And it, it, Pakistan wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to Pakistan if India tells Pakistan to take care of its minority rights. The Pakistanis have to tell the Pakistani authorities to do that. Uh, the other kind of conversion where people would convert just because it's more convenient to live your life in a country which is which has such a large majority of a mainstream religion, uh, that happens. But obviously, it doesn't get reported on, and there are no statistics on it because it's difficult to buy statistics on such things. Stay with me a second, uh, Emar. Uh, in fact. The Minister of State, Home Affairs in India, Mr. Hans Raj Ahir, spoke today on the issue. Let's listen in to what he had to say. The government has done the work. The Minister of State, 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 the Emir, you've been rather candid about your opinion as far as these, uh, you know, these forced conversions go. Are the repercussions equally dire for people who speak up against these kind of conversions? I've been candid on uh, the lack of response uh, on the forced conversion. Obviously, the forced conversion is a big issue. And yes, there is... Um, I mean, uh, some of the problems have been uh, under attack from uh, unknown forces. Usually, these are the militant extremists, but then there are also allegedly state involvement in those experiences. So, similar, yes, there, there there is another activist whom I wouldn't name. who is recently missing as well. He advocates peace and for minorities. So, it is it it is increasingly becoming a harder area to work in, a no-go area for uh, activists and uh, the civil society to talk about. And uh, yes, it is the responsibility of the people of Pakistan to take care of those people. And, um, and the person uh, you're showing, the person who was saying that they will go and protect the rights of minority in Pakistan, uh, I, I mean, it has, I think it has zero practical implication. The Pakistanis have to start rising against this trend. Um, Indians, if they want to do something about it, I think they should do something about the people. Who are, that, for example, threatening to cut off the because those. Maybe they need to stop those people and the Pakistani, Pakistani people need to stop the people who are harassing minorities so we can move forward practically rather than just, you know, like rejoicing in the misery of the other countries, minority, lack of minority rights. Let me ask you this. I don't want to get into the India-Pakistan, uh, you know, exchanging of barbs as far as this goes. I, I decided to take this topic up on the show tonight because Taha Siddiqui, our Islamabad bureau chief, had actually done a story uh, about a young girl called Rani from Khyber Pakhtunkhwa who was also forcibly converts, uh, converted. If I can ask you, Emmer, uh, you said that there, uh, that Pakistanis need to respond to this call themselves. They need to, you know, uh, wake up and uh, perhaps be more aggressive in their stance to work these forced conversions but with so many reports of uh, you know uh, people with liberal uh, points of view uh, bloggers activists uh, journalists even going missing in Pakistan are the avenues for uh, voicing uh, anger are the uh, they, these avenues uh, slowly and steadily being choked up and who do you think is behind that I think uh, I'll answer who's behind that it's it's not a particular institute it's a mindset and uh, this mindset has been nurtured, uh, you know, self-righteousness and the fact that we are better than the others. And it's, 
it's a it's our duty to convert other people and we are more pious i think it's more to do with the mindset rather than institutes or individuals and that mindset as we saw in the recent riots in pakistan where the extremists literally took over the country that mindset is seeping into the populace of the country and i mean i think everybody is to be blamed everybody who is not raising their voice is to be blamed for the atrocities happening to those who are raising their voice okay so my next question is going to be a tough one how does that change i think um, it changes as as slow as it developed it took years to develop it's going to take years to change and it changes from the grassroots level where we have consistent democracy in pakistan democracy ensures freedom of expression when i mean everybody is not into killing people but most people don't really care so much about it so it has to start from bottom up where there is democracy and then there is freedom of expression and then there is actions being violence and there is people when they commit violence or threats of violence they get punished so it starts from very basic elements such as democracy and uh, freedom of expression Do you feel that there's a you know a, a sort of system of one upmanship that's taking place uh, when it comes to influential people in Pakistan political leaders for instance to sort of uh, portray themselves as uh, you know devout muslims to portray themselves as people who won't allow anything uh, to hamper their vision of what they call islam uh, is that competitive factor also uh, causing a great degree of concern and having outcomes on people like the minority communities in Pakistan I mean this is the game of uh, politics politicians worldwide do that even in secular countries uh, if you look at a country you know maybe a country has half atheists as a population but the, their politician is not even 1% atheist so yes in politics you have to play the mainstream religion it happens even in the west in pakistan it happens even more um, as you know that this is the election season is just starting off and the main political parties are now uh you know turning hand with political a bit uh, religious forces because there's so many religious pockets of influence and votes so religion plays a very vital role and if you look at mainstream political parties their stance is usually not as bad till it comes to uh, election days where they have to really cater to every kind of votes so the anti india rhetoric uh, in pakistan and similarly anti pakistan rhetoric in india increases during the election time it's a popular ta- tactic and it so far works for the politician what about so the military what mr what about the military there's uh, the military seem to be taking on more and more of uh, an islamic outlook toward uh, its recruitment what goes on within the military as well and this protection of uh, uh, hardliners that uh, many people accuse uh, the pakistani military of i probably get re- into real trouble for saying this but the military is a completely different ball game when it comes to politics or governance or being in power the military is um, extremely powerful more much more powerful than it should be in any country so the military does not bank on one school of thought or one political party the military is in power because it's it's like a race race um, of horses where the military does not bet on one horse the military has uh, you know different forces it bets on religious secular uh and uh, every type you know rich poor middle class and usually i mean the winning horse has some to do with the um, you know not being against the policy that we not uh putting us the former dictator to have committed heinous crimes so the military yes is in cohorts with the religious uh, political parties the uh, mma the political party which has derived all the religious forces almost all the religious forces in the country the religious forces allegedly is formed uh, at the behest of military it, the military wouldn't stop at just one kind of political party the military has influence on secular political parties many of them have come out now and also admitted that yes the military makes us meet each other and you know, form coalitions and everything i'm not talking about the current military i'm talking about the military as an institute historically speaking sure. i wouldn't say whether they're doing it now or not but the mma the, um, the mutahida majlis e amal which is a collection of all these parties has once again been reactivated a lot of people are saying the military behind it i'm not saying that so the military wouldn't just bet on religious forces but it does have a very close influences with religious forces as well
And this and this uh, problem, Emma, uh, very quickly also extends to uh, non-minority groups, and I'm talking about those that are non-Islamic as well. Uh, uh, we keep hearing about, you know, a sectarian uh, incidents of violence as well. Does violence toward non-Sunni uh, members of Islam also, uh, you know, uh, happen frequently? And do you feel that it gets underreported when compared to uh, instances of forced conversion, let's say, when it comes to uh, Christians or Sikhs within Pakistan? Yes, I mean, my sect is supposed to be the Sunni sect, but I have no shame in admitting that the other uh, major sect, the Shia sect, which is uh, smaller than in population than the Sunni sect, yes, the uh, the actions against the Shias, uh, especially in places like Hazara, the one that you were talking about, and other places, is much more. A lot of people try to put it in balance that, yeah, they're killing each other, but it's uh, mostly, if you see the trend, um, it's the non-Shia pop Muslim population that gets attacked. Some of them uh, don't get recognized uh, as Muslims. Um, some of them, you know, uh, but but the other sects also don't come to help of each other. For example, if a particular sect is designated as non-Muslims, another sect, which is also under attack, wouldn't come to its help. Rather, they would say, yes, they are non-Muslims. So there is no unity amongst the smaller sects either which makes life even more difficult for them. And there are a lot of attacks on Shias and Ismailis, which is also a subsect of Shia. And obviously the Ahmadis and the Mirzaids who are uh, not considered by uh, Muslims by the country. What kind of uh, commentary is this generating in Pakistan, if I can ask you, uh, Emmer, uh, uh, about the incidents that we just talk, talked about, and of course, uh, when it comes to forced conversions? TV channels and I mean this uh, story uh, has been printed, the, the particular one that we were talking about, it has been printed uh, in a couple of newspapers I've read the, the story already. So it's it's not unreported, but it's not like you're making it a big issue, which it is, and it's uh, I think there's nothing wrong with making an issue out of it. It needs to be highlighted. I think Pakistan, uh, Pakistan it's not a very popular thing to do, so commercially it doesn't make a lot of viability. It doesn't sound, you know, profitable to raise issues that people are not really concerned about. So it wouldn't sell. And also, you could get black extremist forces if you're consistently reporting on those lines. So um, it is reported, but it is not highlighted. Fair enough. Uh Emma Shaheen, uh, thanks very much for joining us this evening on the broadcast and uh, I appreciate you being so forthright uh, in sharing your opinion with us about uh, this pressing issue in Pakistan, one that we'll continue to keep a track on uh, here on Beyond.